The story of Nintendo as we know it started in Kyoto, Japan in 1889. That's right, 1889. Japanese entrepreneur Fizuhiro Yamamuchi started a company named Nintendo Karuta to produce and distribute playing cards. This was a tough business to get into at the time due to a Japanese law that was implemented in 1882 to ban gambling because of organized crime. With this ban, most playing cards were banned as well, and most companies abandoned the playing card business altogether because they didn't want to be associated with criminals. However, one type of card was still being allowed, Hanafuda, or flower cards. This made Nintendo the sole producer of these types of playing cards. At first, they made high quality cards using expensive manufacturing processes, but later they made cheaper and more cost efficient cards, making the business very lucrative. It wasn't until 1907 that they started making Western style playing cards like we use today. They entered an agreement with another Japanese company, Naihoi Senbai, or better known as Japan Tobacco, to sell the cards at their cigarette stores. It was also at this time the company changed its name to Mario Fuku Nintendo Card Company. A few years later in 1915, the name was changed again to Yamamuchi Nintendo, but still used the Mario Fuku Nintendo Card Company brand on their cards. Nintendo continued to produce cards through the 1920s. In 1929, Yuzo Hiro departed the company. Due to Japanese culture, he would have to leave the company to his male child, but he did not have one. Instead, he adopted his son in law, Sikiroyo Kendia, and passed the company on to him. By this time, Nintendo was the largest and most successful playing card company in Japan. Sikiroyo took on the surname of Yamamuchi. In 1933, Sikiroyo Created a general partnership and changed the name once again to Yamamuchi Nintendo Company Limited and constructed a new company headquarters right next to the old one in Kyoto. During this time, Sakiroyo was thinking of the future and who would head the company after him, as he did not have any male children either. His plans were to adopt his son in law just as he had been. But he had left his family and the company for unknown reasons, so Sakiyoro. Made his grandson, Hiroshi Yamamuchi, heir to the company when he decided to retire. Then came World War II, which brought a great financial burden onto the company as people were more concentrated on the war effort than playing games. During this time, Hiroshi's wife, Michiku, which came from a wealthy family, supported the business and kept it going. After the war, things did get better as American soldiers came to Japan. And were buying and using Nintendo's playing cards. In 1947, Sikiroyo founded a distribution company for the playing cards called Mary Fuku Company Limited. This is the company that directly turned into the company we all know today as Nintendo Company Limited. In 1949, Sikiroyo had a devastating stroke, which eventually took his life, and Hiroshi became the third and longest lasting president of Nintendo. In 1959, Nintendo formed a partnership with Disney to produce playing cards with Disney characters printed on them, bringing Nintendo into the children's market. Also, in this year, they moved their company headquarters to a different part of Kyoto. In 1962, Nintendo became a publicly traded company on the Kyoto Stock Exchange. A year later, in 1963, they changed their name for the last time to what we all know Nintendo Company Limited and started manufacturing games as well. But by 1964, after the Tokyo Olympics, Japanese people really started getting into Western culture. They started to go out to arcades, bowling alleys, and other places instead of staying at home and playing games. Sales started to slump, and by the end of 1964, Nintendo's stock fell to just 60 yen per share. In 1965, Nintendo hired Gunpai Yokoi for his expertise in manufacturing and assembly line production of electronic devices. With this experience, Yamamuchi put him in charge of the games division. They restructured the company to be more related to games, but still kept the division for playing cards. That division later evolved into making Pokemon cards. This is when Nintendo started producing classic board games like chess, Mahjong, Shoji, 
and the game that inspired Atari's name, Go. In 1970, Nintendo developed its first electronic toy, the Beam Gun. This was designed by Masuki Yorama. It was a light gun that worked with sensors in the targets, and when hit, popped up to show that it was hit. Over one million of these units were sold, Nintendo's first successful electronic toy. So successful, in fact, Nintendo partnered with Magnavox to create the light gun used on the very first game console, the Magnavox Odyssey, in 1971. In the early 1970s, Nintendo found success in their games and toys division, but this ended with the 1973 oil crisis. The cost of producing plastic skyrocketed. This took a toll on production costs at Nintendo, losing billions of yen. Nintendo knew they had to do something. They saw the success Magnavox was having with the Odyssey and made a licensing agreement to use their technology to create their own Pong-type console. The Color TV Game 6 launched in 1977 in Japan, being Nintendo's first video game console as well. This became a series of games such as the Color TV 15, Color TV Game 112, Computer TV Game, and Color TV Game Block Breaker. These went on to be the most successful first-gen consoles, selling more than 3 million units, outselling Atari, Magnavox, and Coleco all together. With the success of the Color TV series, Nintendo was looking ahead, investing that money into future projects such as the Game & Watch and development of their first programmable ROM cartridge video game system, the Famicom. In fact, the Color TV continued on until 1983, Sales from it and the Game & Watch, which released in 1980, fully funded the R&D for the Famicom that was released in 1983. What's it like to play the Nintendo Entertainment System? The NES story starts in the arcades of the early 1980s. Nintendo's success with games such as Donkey Kong led to Nintendo's president, Horushi Yamamuchi, to call for a game console based on arcade machines like Galaxian and Donkey Kong. Originally it was supposed to be a 16-bit home computer with floppy drives and a keyboard, but Yamamuchi rejected this plan. He wanted a cheaper system that people didn't need to be technophiles to be able to use. At this point, Masuki Yorama began the design by October of 1982 and had a test model or prototype built. However, no programming tools were available, so programming started on an NEC PC8001 computer, so basically the PC88, connected to a uh, whole bunch of LEDs, a grid of LEDs really, to create the graphics for the games. The project was named Gamecom. But this name was actually changed to Famicom with a suggestion by Yorama's wife. Now the Famicom was heavily influenced by the ColecoVision. Nintendo saw how much better the games looked on the Coleco as opposed to like an Atari 2600 and that. So they really thought that they would be competing with Coleco in the future and wanted to come up with something that could produce arcade quality graphics. The console was released on July 15, 1983, only in Japan, with three games being released with the system at the time, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye. The console released with some issues. Due to some manufacturing defects, there were some issues with the chips inside that caused the system to crash. But after a recall, the Famicom enjoyed success, much success, and by 1984, it was the best-selling console in Japan. Also in 1984, Nintendo agreed to have third-party publishers make games on it. These first two publishers were Namco and Hudson Soft. They agreed to a deal for 30% fee to Nintendo for console licensing and production cost. And honestly, this was an industry standard um, in the video game market up until 2010. Now Nintendo had its sights on North America, however they were still skeptical of going into that market alone. 
and uh, in 1983, Nintendo started negotiations with Atari to market the Famicom under Atari's name in North America. Uh, the deal was supposed to be signed at the CES show in 1983. However, Atari saw a Nintendo Donkey Kong cartridge being used and displayed in a Coleco display. And basically at that point, they nixed the deal with Nintendo. Um, now at that point, Nintendo decided to go for it on their own. The first idea was to package it as the Nintendo Advanced Video Game System, or AVS. This would include a repackaged Famicom, a keyboard, a cassette data recorder, a wireless joystick, and a basic ROM cartridge. Nintendo did decide against this as it would be too expensive for regular consumers, and with the video crash, game crash, they were worried that the console and computer just wouldn't sell. So Nintendo first used the Famicom hardware in North America in the Versus Arcade cabinets. This was basically just a test to see how gamers would react to what was really a home video game system in this cabinet. It was a huge success. The US, uh, the Versus system became the highest grossing arcade cab by 1985. With this, Nintendo went ahead and designed the North American Famicom system. The system would have a front-loading uh, assembly that resembled a VCR for user familiarity. It also helped prevent ESD or electronic static discharge in dry climates like Nevada and Arizona. The new case was designed by Lance Barr. At this point, the Nintendo AVS system was renamed to the Nintendo Entertainment System. The change came due to Nintendo wanting to distance itself from the video game market, essentially after the crash. And that's why it's not called the Nintendo Video Game System. It released in two test markets, in New York City in October of 1985 and in Los Angeles in February of 1986. It was very successful in those markets. So Nintendo decided to release the NES nationwide on September 27, 1986. Now as technology advanced, obviously game consoles are going to be discontinued. Now the NES was discontinued in 1995, basically giving it a nine year run in the North American market. Um, now the Famicom on the other hand was discontinued in the year 2000. So that really gave that console a 17 year run on the market. Over the course of its lifespan and all the different iterations of it, the Famicom, the Nintendo, um, it did sell about 62 million units. Words can't describe the endless challenge of Super Mario World, so we let the players do the talking. Super Mario World is here. It's one of the new generation of Nintendo games. It comes only with Super Nintendo, and it's like nothing you've ever faced. Now you're playing with power. Super power. The story of the SNES starts in 1987. A newcomer to the gaming industry, NEC, had just released the 16-bit PC Engine in Japan. Nintendo's president, Hiroshi Yamamuchi, had seen NEC and its product as a strong competitor to the NES, which started to worry Nintendo. At this point, sales of the NES were still great, but Yamamuchi knew this would not last long with the great graphics and sound that the PC Engine was able to produce. Also in 1987, it was announced that Sega was about to launch their 16-bit system, the Mega Drive. In September of 1987, Nintendo announced the development of the Super Famicom and a new Super Mario Bros. 4 game. The system was being developed by none other than Masayuki Yumarara, who had developed the NES. Nintendo at this time was worried more about the NEC than Sega. The reason for this is that Sega had released a few consoles in the 8-bit era, but were completely overshadowed by the Famicom and the NES. Nintendo was really not in a hurry to develop a new 16-bit system because sales of the NES were still going good. However, this did not last long. Some feel Nintendo made this announcement in 1987 to stall sales of the PC Engine during the Christmas season. In 1988, Sega released the Mega Drive, and the PC Engine was picking up steam as well. 
NES sales started to slump, and Nintendo knew they had to get a new system on the market. Development went into full swing, but since Nintendo was so late to the game, it took a couple years to develop. The first prototypes of the system were shown to the public in 1988, and again before its launch in Japan in 1989. In 1989, both Sega and NEC had released their systems in North America, but changed the names to TurboGrafx-16 and the Sega Genesis. By the time the Super Famicom was ready to be launched, Sega was starting to take a lead in the gaming industry. With a good amount of games in its library, NEC was no slouch either. Nintendo, for the first time, had to deal with true competition. This marked one of the greatest console wars in history. Sega vs Nintendo. Nintendo released the Super Famicom in 1990 in Japan and it instantly sold out of the 300,000 units that were made. The system was then released in North America under the name Super Nintendo in 1991. Also around this time, Nintendo was aware of the CD add-on that Sega was about to release and wanted one for their own Super NES system so it could stay competitive. They had contracted out with Sony to develop the CD add-on named, you guessed it, the PlayStation. However, during the CES show in 1991, Nintendo reneged on their deal with Sony to produce it and went with Philips. Possibly one of the worst mistakes Nintendo ever made, birthing a monster in the gaming industry to this day, Sony's PlayStation. Philips went on to develop the CDI when Nintendo discontinued the CD add-on, but Philips still had a contract with Nintendo. This is why we have those weird CDI Zelda and Mario games like Hotel Mario and Zelda's Adventure. Once again, Nintendo had a lot of publishers developing for it, and unlike the Genesis, the games could be enhanced with special chips in the carts for sound and graphics. Also, it was capable of pseudo 3D graphics. During this time, sales of the system skyrocketed. As most older gamers used the Genesis, younger gamers chose the SNES. This was all part of the console war. This is a strategy that worked atop Sega then, but would not work on future consoles, as it was shown by Sony's marketing of the PS1 to older gamers in the market, while Nintendo was still marketing to kids with the N64. The SNES went on to sell just under 50 million units worldwide, being launched in 1990 in Japan and finally being discontinued in the UK in 2005, giving the system an amazing 15 year lifespan, making it one of the longest lasting game systems to ever hit the market. It came from the third dimension, with its own brain, its own voice. It's own legs. There's only one problem. It needs your eyes. Virtual Boy. See it now in 3D. The story of the Nintendo Virtual Boy actually starts in the mid-1980s with a company named Reflection Technology Incorporated. They created a stereoscopic head tracking prototype called Private Eye, which featured a tank game. Needing funds to support their business ambitions, they went to the Consumer Electronics Show. There, they showed the Private Eye off to several companies including Mattel, Sega, and Hasbro. All those companies declined, but one company in particular showed interest in the Private Eye prototype, and that was Nintendo. Gunpai Yokoi, which was the inventor of the Game & Watch and Game Boy, led engineering R&D 1 group of Nintendo. He thought the oscillating mirror display technology was cutting edge. Negotiations started and Nintendo came to a licensing agreement with Reflection Technology to use their display technology in their new game console. After years of development, the head tracking technology was dropped due to health implications to the people using it, but Nintendo kept the stereoscopic display technology. After several different colors and also a full color display was tested, it was found that the red and black screen was cheaper to produce and easier on the eye for the user. Nintendo predicted the console to be a big seller, even opening a new factory in China specifically for the production of the Virtual Boy. Nintendo predicted over 3 million units sold over Christmas time and over 16 million units of software sold by that time as well. It was debuted at the 1995 E3 and the CES shows. 
but already the reviews were starting to look bad. Many people at the shows that tried out the new console complained of headaches and eye strain. The Virtua Boy was released in Japan on July 21st, 1995 and in North America on August 16th, 1995 at a price of $179.95. There were four launch games that coincided with its release. Mario Tennis, Red Alarm, Telluro Boxer, Galactic Pinball. After its release, there were several complaints from parents about headaches and eye strain from children. Even though the console warned users to take breaks, kids just didn't listen. Imagine that. Sales of the console plummeted. Nintendo tried dire promotions to show off the 3D capabilities as opposed to 2D console games, but this marketing tactic failed as well. After the Christmas season of 1995 and the slow sales of the Virtual Boy, Nintendo decided to discontinue production of the console and games. I'm not really sure the exact date that it was discontinued, but I believe it had about an 11 month lifespan. This was Nintendo's worst console failure, selling only 770,000 units in total. How to use one of these? GoldenEye, load a rumble pack and see how it feels when 007 meets N64. The story of the N64 really begins in the early 1990s. At this time, Nintendo knew that they would need to start development of a system to replace the Super Nintendo and enter into the next generation of consoles. This is where Silicon Graphics Incorporated, a graphics visualization and supercomputing company, comes into the picture. SGI was looking at expanding their company by putting some of their technology into consumer projects. Jim Clark, founder of SGI, contacted Sega of America and spoke with Tom Kalutsky. Kalinsky was impressed with what he saw, but ultimately Sega did not buy the technology. After Sega engineers evaluated the hardware and technology, they found several issues within it or they said. They wanted to own it outright, and SGI was not willing to give up the rights to its own technology. After no deal was struck with Sega, Clark then spoke with CEO of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamamuchi, in early 1993. Nintendo was willing to license the chipset instead of owning it outright. On August 23, 1993, Nintendo and SGI came to an agreement initiating what would be called Project Reality. Technology from Project Reality would be used in the arcades as soon as 1994 and in the home console market by 1995. Reality Emergent Technology is the name SGI had given its components used in Project Reality. Initially, Project Reality was developed into the Onyx supercomputer, costing $100,000 to $250,000 for the game development system. It was filled with reality Engine 2 graphic boards and four 150 MHz RISC CPUs. The APIs were based on Performer and OpenGPL. On June 23, 1994, Nintendo announced the official name of its console as the Ultra 64. Developers started signing on with Nintendo, including Rare, Acclaim, DMA Designs, Ocean, and many more. Around this time, the Project Reality team prototyped the game controller for the system. Basically, they used the SNES controller and added an analog stick with the Z button. This prototype controller eventually became the N64 controller, but the design of this controller was so secretive that once developers were using it, they had to hide it in a box after they were done. While development of the console continued, Nintendo and developers started developing games on an Onyx supercomputer based development system. Eventually these systems were replaced by cost reduced SGI indie workstations which had a fully accurate console simulation board within the system to help with the ease of development. The console was publicly revealed for the first time in 1994 and showed the console with the Nintendo Ultra 64 logo a ROM cartridge, but no controller at this time. Also in late 1994, Nintendo started licensing agreements with Midway and Williams to create arcade games based on the Ultra 64. These games were Killer Instinct and Cruising USA. Although the Ultra 64 arcade boards were based on the Ultra 64 game console, they used a different chipset with no reality coprocessor and also used hard drives. Also around this time, Nintendo decided to go ahead and rename the game console from the Ultra 64 to the Nintendo 64. This was based on Konami who had ownership of the Ultra Games trademark 
and Nintendo was afraid that they might be sued over trademark infringement. So the name was changed to the Nintendo 64, or better known as the N64. But a cool tidbit of information is that the software and hardware on the N64 still used the NUS prefix, which stands for Nintendo Ultra 64. Originally, the N64 was slated to be released by the Christmas season of 1995. However, due to hardware problems with the chips underperforming, they had to be redesigned again. The delay went into the spring of 1996. At this time, Nintendo's software development kit was completely redesigned as a Windows-based partner N64 system by Kyoto Microcomputers. On June 23, 1996, the N64 was released in Japan and on September 26, 1996, released in North America. The console was originally slated to be sold in the US for $250, but the launch price was reduced down to $199.99 to make it competitive with Sony and Sega. Nintendo at this point knew that Sony and Sega had basically sewed up the adult and teen market in video games. So the N64 specifically targeted preteens. The N64 was quite a successful console, selling just under 33 million units worldwide. It was eventually discontinued on April 30th, 2002. This gave the N64 a six year lifespan. Nintendo GameCube. The story of the Nintendo GameCube starts in 1996. The N64 had just launched and Nintendo started development of a new console they named the N2000. In 1997, a new company called ArtX was created as a spin-off of SGI, the company that helped Nintendo develop the N64. As many as 20 engineers from SGI came to ArtX and was led by Wee Yin, who was head of Nintendo operations for SGI and led Project Reality that eventually became the N64. Starting in May of 1998, ArtX partnered with Nintendo to design the system logic and graphics processor for the new console. The GPU was codenamed Flipper. Also around this time, Nintendo partnered with IBM to create the CPU for the system codenamed Gecko and with Panasonic to create the system drive mechanism. The name of the project was changed from N2000 to StarCube, then Nintendo advanced during this time. In May of 1999, the console was first announced with another new codename, Project Dolphin. After this, Nintendo started supplying development kits to third-party developers. In April of 2000, Artex was acquired by ATI. Although the Flipper GPU was already finished by Artex, this is why the ATI logo is on the front of the GameCube. It was at this time that ATI stated that they are now a major supplier of graphics chips for the game console market and boasted about how they were the top of the hill with their 128-bit architecture. Also in development at this time was a motion controller that was supposed to be used with the system. Nintendo had patented this idea. Unfortunately, the final design was not ready for the launch of the console and it was postponed until their next console, the Wii. A lot of the games that were being developed for the N64 were postponed and ported over to the Dolphin as launch titles. The last first party game released on the N64 was in May of 2001, six months before the launch of the Dolphin. It was also at this time that the console name was changed to the GameCube. On May 21st, 2001, it was revealed at A3 
at a price of $199.99, which was $100 less than either the PS2 or the Xbox. The GameCube launched in Japan on September 14, 2001, and in North America on November 18, 2001. In Japan, 300,000 of the 450,000 units that were made sold in the first three days, and in North America, over 600,000 units were sold by December of 2001. Nintendo thought they had a hit on their hands. They had predicted 50 million units sold by 2005, but this was not the case. Only 22 million were sold by that time. But because of the lack of a true DVD player, like its competition, the games marketed towards kids, and most older gamers seeing it as toyish, it did not do well competing with the Xbox and the PS2. In fact, it is the third worst selling Nintendo console, with only the Virtual Boy and the Wii U being worse sellers. With the Wii being launched in 2006, Nintendo announced that the GameCube would be discontinued in February of 2007. The last official game, Madden NFL 2008, being released on August 14, 2007. The Nintendo GameCube had a six-year lifespan from 2001 to 2007, selling over 22 million units and being Nintendo's third worst-selling console. Game over, man! It's game over!